Hi, Lee First at Headwater Science Center in Bemidji, Minnesota. I'm bringing you a book today called How Animals Defend Themselves. As much as I like this page, I'm going to switch to this one. How's that showing up on the camera? Ryan? Ryan's on the other side. Right there? I like that one because it shows up later, and if you look really carefully, especially at the tongue, well, it's not a tongue. But here we go with How Animals Defend Themselves. Just a couple of side notes before we get to the book. This is Orion. For all of you who have followed us now for months and months and months and months, you know that Wednesday is Read to Orion Day, and he gets read to almost every single Wednesday. Orion enjoys these books. I hope he enjoys today. Now, how animals defend themselves. Here's a little bit about how even Orion would defend himself. He happens to live here at the Headwater Science Center, so it's not a big concern of his how he defends himself. I'm masking today because we are open seven days a week here at the Headwater Science Center, 9.30 to 5 o'clock, Monday through Saturdays, and on Sundays from 1 to 5. And we require masks. So on your way to the Headwater Science Center, next time you head our way, pull out that mask, whether you haven't worn it for a couple of months now, or you just aren't exactly sure where it is, uh, pull out that mask when you're headed there. We do have these masks, which we will gladly sell to you or even give to you as you come to the door. So there you are. We do have masks. So once you come in the door, we're asking all our guests and visitors to mask the entire time they're here. How animals defend themselves. This is from the Bemidji Library. Here we are, all right. How animals defend themselves. Uh, yes, it's a nonfiction piece of literature. So one of the fun things about nonfiction is they often have a table of contents. That helps you a lot. You can just say, oh, well, the chapter I'm the most interested in is, and then you could just skip right to that chapter in particular. What, da when danger is near, what do you do when you are afraid? Do you yell for help? Do you yell for help? Uh, do you hide and run away? Some animals do these things too when they are afraid, but many animals protect themselves from danger in amazing ways. Look at this bright, look at the bright colors of this blue ringed octopus, blue ringed octopus. Now, here is what the blue ringed octopus looks like when danger is near. The octopus can change its colors so it's harder to see in the ocean. Read on to find out more about some of the ways animals protect themselves from danger. Putting on a show. If you were a very small animal, how would you protect yourself from being eaten? Take a look at these animals. If a snake is near, a toad may puff himself up and stretch out his back legs. This makes him look like he's too big for a snake to swallow. So it's a picture of a toad. This one, if you'll remember, I showed it to you right at the be very beginning of the reading. The citrus swallowtail caterpillar scares away hungry birds by pretending to be a snake. It has a fake red tongue that looks just like the tongue of a snake. And the blue tongue skink, aha, an animal we actually have here at the Headwater Science Center. A blue tongue skink is a kind of lizard when it's frightened, it sticks out its huge, big, blue tongue. This scares away animals that want to eat it. Blue tongue skink. I'm going to tell you, come and see. The tongue is definitely blue. I don't happen to think it's quite that large, but maybe from the perspective of an animal. When she really wants to stick it out, she can flatten it pretty wide. All right, there see, it is. Sometimes when she's traveling in particular, she gets a little upset in her carrier and you'll see her All right. sticking her tongue out like that. Good, because I've never seen it, so maybe she's never been frightened or scared when I've been around. Yeah, the African cutthroat finch is another animal that pretends to be a snake when it when danger is near. It can hiss and wiggle its body just like a snake. The eye hawk moth looks like a dead leaf when it rests on a branch, but if a hungry bird gets too close, this moth uncovers its back wings. The wings have spots that make it look like two huge owl eyes. That's enough to scare away almost any hungry bird. 
Can you find me? When an animal looks like it's when an animal looks like its surroundings, we say it has camouflage. Camouflage makes an animal hard for its enemies to see. So here's a picture of the Australian tawny frog moth. Mouth. Oh, mouth, sorry. <laughs> the Australian tawny frog mouth. Ryan could probably see that word, but he actually knew exactly what animal I was talking about because he was in Australia. Anyway, is a bird that sleeps in a tree all day. Its body shape and brown feathers make it look like a broken tree branch. And guess what the decorator crab uses for camouflage? That would be seaweed. It cuts pieces of seaweed with its claws, then it sticks the seaweed onto the back on its back. This is a good way to hide from danger. It's called the decorator crab. Then the flounder hunts for food at the bottom of the ocean. If it is on a sandy bottom, its skin changes like to look like sand. On a rocky bottom, it would change the way it looks so that it looks more like rocks. The beaver uses branches and mud to build a home in the middle of a pond. Inside there's a room that is dry and cozy. The only way to get inside is through a secret underwater tunnel. Hungry bears can't get in. Copycats. Some animals are copycats. They look and act like animals that their enemies don't want to eat. Birds know that a monarch butterfly is poisonous to eat. The viceroy butterfly looks a lot like the monarch butterfly. So birds stay away from it. They actually stay away from both butterflies. I love this little story. Birds and lizards eat spiders, but they don't like ants. That's why many spiders try to look like ants. They hold their two legs out in front of their head to make it look like the ants' antenna. Birds don't eat honeybees either because they know honeybees can sting. So the hoverfly looks like a honeybee to fool birds. The hoverfly will even buzz just like a bee if a bird is near. So take a look. It's a little bit, look at it really carefully, because an uh, ant would have six legs, the spider would have eight legs. So the spider takes its front two legs, sticks them out over the top of its head. It's just imitating the ant, which is right there. Sticking something out in front of it, too. Yep. I don't know what that is. But, yeah, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what that is either. Looks a lot like an ant. Right. Now, I want you to know we don't have either one of these snakes here. I've heard this story a number of times. Are these two snakes twins? Look closely. You'll see that they are different. The coral snake is poisonous, but the king snake is not. Animals can tell the difference, can't tell the difference between the two snakes. Well, they stay away from both of them. All right, now we're back to an animal we have at the Science Center, so you can come in and see this one. Some animals have a hard shell that protects them from being hurt by other animals. Turtles have a hard shell that protects their body. The three-toed box turtle has a special kind of shell. The bottom part of its shell, it can fold up, keeping the turtle safe inside. Box turtle, holding it up. Come in and see our box turtle. We don't have an armadillo. The three-banded armadillo rolls itself into a ball. If, the animal tries, if an animal tries to attack, the hard shell on the outside of the ball protects the armadillo. Then, a thick, heavy shell protects the giant clam. Its shell is as long as a bathtub. Let's try that again. As long as a bathtub. Do a little imagining now. It's the size of the shell is the size of your bathtub. A thick, heavy shell protects the giant clam. Its shell is as long as a bathtub. No animal can break or open the giant clam's shell. And the picture that was on the front page, that's of a porcupine. The North American porcupine's body is covered with thousands of sharp quills. If an animal tries to attack, the porcupine swings its tail back and forth. The quills stick into the attacker. When it gets hit, 
by the tail. And it shows you a close-up of the tip of the porcupine tail or quill. Warning, stay away. I don't like getting this page today. Some animals have bright colors that, that send a warning to the enemy. Stay away, don't eat me, or I'll get you sick. Striped skunk has two long stripes starting right there at their head and going all the way up their tail. These stripes tell enemies, stay away. They don't. The skunk sprays them in the face. Now, as bad as that smell is, it can also make the enemy blind for several hours. Ladybugs are bright red or yellow with, with black spots. These colors tell birds, spiders, and beetles not to eat ladybugs. They're horrible tasting. The oriental fire-bellied toad shows enemies the bright orange of its belly. This is a warning that the toad's skin has a poison that burns. Brian, what animal do you think is on the next page? Give you a clue. He lives here. Uh, is it about more color warning stuff? Yes, it's color warning stuff. Is it the cor or the uh, the hognose snake? It is the hognose snake. Yep. No, it's not the very next page. It's coming. No. <laughs> These poison arrow frogs live in the rainforest in South America. Their bright color tells enemies that their skin is poisonous. A bird or snake that tries to eat one of these frogs will spit it out. Ooh, I gave you too early of a hint what's <laughs> coming. Sorry. Some animals try to stay safe by living in groups. Other animals live with a different kind of animal, and they help each other out. Sticking together is safer than living alone. Dolphins live in groups. If a hungry shark comes near, the dolphins all attack. Just think about that. There's a picture of six dolphins attacking the shark because six is better than one. They hit the shark all over with their beaks. Impalas and baboons often travel together. Impalas have really good hearing and um, they can smell really well. Baboons are good at seeing danger. Together they help each other stay safe. And this one I thought was real interesting. The ox pecker bird lives on the back of an African buffalo. Why? Because it eats the insects that live on the buffalo's hide. Now, if danger comes, the ox pecker, that's the name of that bird, the ox pecker warns the buffalo, calls out, it flaps its wings. If the buffalo still doesn't pay attention, the ox pecker pecks the buffalo right on top of his head. And I thought this one was very interesting. A little fish called Luther's goby and a blind shrimp are good partners. The shrimp digs a burrow for both of them to live in. So the shrimp is in charge, in charge of digging the hole, which you probably heard. He's blind. The goby leads the shrimp out on feeding expeditions. The shrimp keeps its antenna in touch with the go goby's tail. The goby wiggles its tail. The shrimp knows it's time to be getting going because it's dangerous. The two go to hide back in their burrow. Many animals save their lives by playing tricks on their enemies. Here's a American possum. And here's the hognose snake. Oh, I was wrong about the hognose snake being in here because it's color. It's in here because it's playing dead. But our hognose snake is very bright orange and black on its bottom side. So, the hognose snake and the American possum both fool enemies by pretending they're dead. The hognose snake even drips blood out of its open mouth. Ryan, you ever, ever seen that? I've never seen ours do the play dead thing at all. Yeah. Like it has the color on the belly that's supposed to be a display thing during that, but I've actually never seen ours do it. Yeah. It's been here a long time. It's pretty used to having people around a lot. <laughs> yeah. Our guests and visitors probably know this. Our snakes... They get held every single day, many, many, many times a day. And they probably don't ever have this fear, like they have to play like they're dead or flip over. And so our hognose snake has never felt the need to actually drip blood out of its mouth, We've faking. Same, same thing happens with our cockroaches. We have the least hissy, hissing cockroaches I've ever met because they're so used to being around people at this point. Wow. 
now the gecko's tail. Again, another reason to come to the Headwater Science Center. If an enemy grabs the tail of a leopard gecko, guess what happens? The tail breaks off, but it keeps right on wiggling. The tail breaks off and keeps right on wiggling. This surprises the enemy, and it gives the gecko time to escape. The gecko's tail will grow back, but it won't be as long and as straight as it was before. Come on in to the Headwater Science Center. We have a gecko story to tell you. I just thought that whole page was really interesting. We come to the very last page. It's kind of interesting how this author just all of a sudden ends the story. Lots of books would give you some sort of summary. This one just all of a sudden, the book is empty. I mean, the book is finished. You can't catch me. And many animals can escape from danger because they're fast. They can quickly run, fly, or swim away. The Australian sugar glider can't fly like a bird, but it can glide through the air. It sails from one tree to another by stretching out its skin, flaps on the side of its body. It stir, stirs with, steers with its fluffy tail. So the question would be, Orion, which one is yours? Which one is your animals defend themselves? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story about Orion. Right now, Orion is so much a domesticated rabbit, he's actually a domesticated lop, that some of those things he would need to live in the wild, he just doesn't have. He doesn't possess him. He's a domesticated lop. So he doesn't really have that camouflage one they talk about. So I would put it at this one. He's very, very fast. So he would have to rely on his speed. Well, and the other thing that the book didn't talk about but is really valuable is... Living in burrows is pretty great, too. <laughs> yep, yep. So he would typically be living not in the enclosure like we have here, but in a burrow. Well, I'm going to encourage you to tune in because the topic of how animals defend themselves is one we talk about all the time here at the Headwater Science Center. Come down and see the ones that they named in the book. Come down and ask us questions that maybe you have now that you've watched the show. Well, thanks for tuning in today. Orion, you'd like to say goodbye to the camera?